digital dividends, strengthening the analog foundation of the digital revolution. Delivering services, connecting for a capable and accountable government with Stephen Davenport. Hello, I'm gonna talk about digital technology and delivering services. Digital technology has been hailed as a cure for many of the toughest obstacles to high quality government service delivery, but is it the miracle we'd like it to be? The answer is, as usual, it depends. Bill Gates himself has said, automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify the efficiency. Automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. Fundamentally, digital technology is just a new way of accomplishing certain tasks. Although we're talking about technology, it always comes back to people and institutions. Just as giving someone paper and pen doesn't make them a best-selling author, Installing a digital system doesn't make a healthcare provider provide better services, but it can have a big impact if the user has the will and determination and the skills to employ it wisely. Even low-income countries have invested massively in e-government over the last couple of decades. By 2014, the vast majority of countries had automated tax systems, customs, and government financial management, as well as digital identification schemes. We have also seen dramatic examples of the usefulness of digital technologies to overcome geographic, infrastructure, and administrative bottlenecks in emergencies like disease outbreaks, natural disasters, and conflict. For example, the Ebola epidemic in 2014 created logistical challenges for organizations that responded, not least how to pay field workers in remote and rural locations. The UNDP set up a scheme to use mobile phones to make direct payments to Ebola response workers in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, who numbered some 60,000 at the height of the crisis. So let's dive deeper into what technology can really do to improve government service delivery. I'll talk about four major ways that it can enable change. One, informing citizens and giving them identity. Two, streamlining processes and simplification three, gathering feedback and engagement, and four, better monitoring. For citizens to understand their options with respect to health care, education, safety, and other areas, they need access to information. The provision of information, particularly to poor citizens in remote locations through mobile phones, has already helped to make better decisions on a variety of issues. mHealth, or mobile health, is a particularly promising area, such as projects that send SMS text message reminders to parents to get their children vaccinated, or reminders to patients with HIV on their therapy schedules. Given citizens a digital identity is also very useful. Currently, 2.4 billion people worldwide don't have birth certificates or other official documents to prove their identity, often preventing them from opening bank accounts, owning property, or receiving government cash transfers. In India, for example, a digital identification scheme for its workfare program shortened the time from paying beneficiaries by 29% and reduced leakages and anti-corruption by 35%. This is especially relevant for those who have been often been left behind. Investments in digital identity can promote inclusion and empowerment of women. A welfare program in Pakistan uses a debit card system linked to biometric identification to pay beneficiaries. The system automatically credits cardholder accounts every month with the appropriate cash amount. This means that recipients don't have to wait in line for cash or worry about keeping the payments safe. Since women mostly receive payments on behalf of the household, this increases their authority to make decisions on their mobility and how the cash is spent. A similar scheme in Niger led to improved nutrition for children, in part because of the time saving for mothers. Also, by making the amount and timing of the cash transfers less observable, it increases the women's bargaining power in the household. As one beneficiary of the program in Pakistan has said, women are being encouraged and empowered. Women now have the confidence that they too can do something for the betterment of the family. Turning to a second way in which digital technology can improve service delivery, there is a significant potential for tools that streamline manual processes. These can include providing cash benefits, as the examples from Niger and Pakistan showed. They can also include making it easier for citizens to pay taxes or access services. 
One initiative in Colombia uses smart fare cards to provide income-based subsidies to users of public transportation. 64% of people in Bogota, Colombia, rely on public transportation. Low-income residents in particular often live far from where they work and spend as much as a quarter of their income on transportation. So the city introduced a 50% discount for users making 40 trips per month. Eligible users receive the transport subsidy on a smart fare card that they are replenishing at charging stations. This system reduces leakages and abuse of the benefits and effectively targets those who will actually use it. However, as with other types of e-government programs, new systems must be accompanied by regulatory and administrative reform. For example, in Uganda, a system for e-filing of taxes proved to be more complicated than the manual one, and taxpayers had to file paper returns in addition to the e-filing. As a result, the time to prepare and pay taxes actually increased. A third way for governments to use digital technology to improve service delivery is to collect user feedback, which enables governments to regularly track satisfaction and identify problems. The idea is for governments to use technology in the way that private firms do and have been doing for some time to track their customers' complaints and ideas and to communicate with them about the status of their requests. This user-centric approach is relatively new for the public sector. Well-known examples include mobile apps such as Fix My Street, which allows residents to report problems like potholes and track and fix requests. This example exhibits several of the characteristics needed to make feedback an effective catalyst for service improvement. First, it's specific and actionable. The presence of a pothole is easy to verify. Users have a clear incentive to report since they are personally inconvenienced. Government has the incentive and capability to respond. It's clear what entity is responsible for resolving it, and the status and results are easy to monitor. Services that are private goods, such as water and electric utilities, property registrations, welfare payments, and licensing services are also easy to monitor. And because they are private goods, citizens are more inclined to give feedback on them since they don't have to be concerned about free riding. One example is a complaint mechanism developed by the water and sewage company in Nairobi known as Maji Voice. Customers first log a complaint with Maji Voice in person or via phone and are given a ticket number to use as a tracking tool. They then receive text messages confirming the request and alerting them when it has been resolved. Prior to Maji Voice, the utility received about 400 complaints a month. Since the program began, it has been receiving about 3,000 complaints a month. Resolution rates have also increased dramatically from 46% to 94%, and the time to resolve issues has dropped by 90%. Part of the institutional process is for data from monthly management reports to be used as a basis for performance incentives for staff. When it comes to issues that are far more complex, subjective, and the result of inputs from many stakeholders, such as the overall quality of public education or healthcare, it is much more difficult to identify service delivery failures and attribute responsibility to specific actors. Also, these kinds of issues generally cannot be fixed immediately by the stroke of the pen. Issues that lend themselves to user feedback, such as whether teachers show up to teach, may be the only clear routes for feedback to have an impact. Building on the idea of collective user feedback, governments can use digital technology to improve service provider management by involving citizens in service delivery monitoring. For example, estimates suggest that in India, roughly one quarter of government teachers and over one third of government doctors in primary health centers are absent without a le legitimate reason on any given day, with similarly alarming numbers in several African countries. It is costly and difficult for governments to directly monitor this problem, but users can help through digital monitoring initiatives, which have been piloted in a number of countries. Using mobile phones, citizens can record provider attendance through photographs or thumbprints and transmit the data into a central database. This can be practical and cost-effective strategy, but technology alone is not enough. It must be accompanied by sound management that creates the right incentives for actors at each step of the process. In many cases, government bureaucracies have simply added a digital veneer over a largely unchanged set of procedures and organizational culture. Moreover, while technology, social media in particular, has shined a light on egregious abuses of power, 
digital technology has not prompted the kind of sustained collective action needed to address weak service delivery. The examples we have looked at so far have shown some specific ways that digital technologies can lead to improvements in service delivery. But the unfortunate reality is that the investments in e-government have often failed, and in many cases, these failures have come with enormous financial costs. It's difficult to determine a precise rate of success or failure, but various estimates suggest that around 30% of these projects are unsuccessful, with the project abandoned before completion. Another 50 to 60% are partial failures with significant budget and time overruns, and only a limited number of project objectives are achieved. Fewer than 20% are successes. In some cases where safeguards are lacking or institutions are particularly weak, the e-government projects can actually exacerbate existing problems such as fraud and corruption. On the financial side, it is not uncommon for an e-government project to go far over budget as they pose serious risks to the government's fiscal health. Moreover, advocates of digital technology sometimes argue that technology will promote open government by democratizing access to information and enabling citizens to hold governments to account. We have to be careful about this kind of argument, as it is clear that many autocratic governments have promoted e-government while at the same time censoring the internet, for example. This doesn't mean that there aren't benefits from the digital investments. Autocratic governments can use technology to improve service delivery in specific areas, but this should not be confused with opening up space for civil society or citizen engagement. Sometimes digital technologies actually help governments to strengthen surveillance and exert a tighter grip on collective action. Another angle to consider is the impact of the internet and digital technologies, such as online voting, in increasing voter turnout, making elections fairer and freer, and enabling more informed voting. Here, the record is also mixed, with online voting prompting higher turnout in some cases, but often among the privileged elite. However, electronic elections can reduce errors in fraud and voting, and in some cases can increase turnout among the poor, as with Brazil's introduction of voting machines in the 1990s. The question of whether access to information afforded by the internet and digital technologies has, has made voters more informed clearly has a more mixed and complicated record. To conclude, we have seen that there are cases where digital technologies have had a real impact, particularly when the government is capable and motivated to serve its citizens better. However, in the absence of a willing and able government, technology often fails to deliver on expectations. The quality of government institutions is the key variable. One must also remember that technology change moves faster than institutional change. Administrative and political reforms require sustained political will and leadership that often takes longer than the typical political life cycle. It also requires the mobilization of civil society offline as well as online. But depending on the particular context, there can be entry points for digital initiatives that generate benefits even in the absence of strong institutions. For example, the extent that digital services are based on routine tasks that lend themselves to monitoring, they can lead to improvements in narrowly defined service delivery tasks, such as providing cash transfers. And if service delivery problems are easy to identify and to attribute to those responsible, and the improvements are highly visible to citizens, there may be an opportunity for impact, as in the case of Maji Voice. The policy goal, therefore, is to use technology in a strategic ways to strengthen institutions. Rather than waiting for strong institutions to emerge, reformers in the government and civil society can access the unique opportunities that exist in their countries to use technology as a catalyst for broader change.